the world interacts with me the way they interact with my dad, but not my mom. What's going on here? You know, so I, Interesting. my black family has always said, you're one of us. When I go, Ezlalin, there's no, there's no difference about it. Like, and I'm part, I'm also Shlubi. Welcome. Um, they're saying Dili Shlubi Lim Shope. Now, how weird is, I grew up in a white house with a white mother, but I must now go to the mountain. On culture. Good culture. Hello and welcome to yet another episode. Thank you very much for joining us. We are on 40,000 subscribers. We thank you very much for liking, subscribing, and always commenting on the content today. I have a very special guest, a man who I've consumed for the last two, three years, as is doing YouTube, uh, SMWX, with dope interviews such as Abu Talim Bofu, ironically. Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and people such as uh, uh, Jacob Zuma and a lot of other people as well. Of course, uh, fan favorite is Ewokogo uh, Obramachiko on his channel, uh, Season Bofu Welsh or Dr. Season Bofu Welsh. Thank you very much for joining us. How are you? Nkuleko. Nkuleko and culture audience. Good. Really glad to be here and shout out to you for what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you so much, man. Um, I was thinking, who the hell do I speak to next? <laughs> and you were a last minute replacement for someone. Oh, wow. Thank <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks. Now that you've got 40,000 subscribers, we were 30,000 subscribers are just small people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The first time I saw you was uh, on, people know that I'm a hip hop head. Mm. Um, I saw you on Entity. It yeah. was a music group with yourself. Wow. Uh, I think, you yeah. out, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then it was, Keenan Forbes, uh, oh. who is known as AKA. This is uh, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, what was, what was your name on Entity? My name was Vice Versa. <laughs> <laughs> Don't laugh, bro. Don't laugh. That's a cool name. <laughs> and there was the meaning behind it was because I had a black father and a white mother. So I was like Vice Versa. And then there was also like, I was writing verses. So Vice Versa. I think, I think it was cool. Nah, man. comment below if you think it was cool. Yeah. I should probably go back to that. You guys are cheesy names, so it's <laughs> vice versa, aka and vice versa, aka and Greyhound. Was Atlanta is Atlanta. Greyhound. Yeah, it was Greyhound. Okay, where did you guys meet? Yeah, so we met at school, we met at St. John's College where we went to school. Um, Kenan was actually at St. John's, I think, from even like earlier grades. Atlanta and I arrived in grade eight high school at St. John's, and that year in grade eight and grade nine, because we were feeling quite alienated with the environment in St. John's at the time, it was like a 95% white school, yeah. um, students and staff. We started to find a home in hip hop. We found it a place for confident black expression. Mm. Um, we started learning how to beatbox, how to make music, how to make beats and produce. And yeah, so that's, that's how we met. It was kind of like uh, a feeling of, black confidence within an alienated environment mm. in a white world. And you guys identified as black. We did. We did. And I think part of the reason was that like there were so many white students around us um, and many people, I think, who were in these kind of private schools at the time will identify with that feeling of being, um, you know, in a sea of, of white people and trying to find points of connection with others that you could, you know, identify around. Yeah. I would argue that if you guys were in Cape Town, where I come from, you would identify as current. Um, it's possible. So, so, so Kenan, I think, always identified as, as colored, um, okay. I must say. Um, Dantla would identify as black. I would be identified sometimes as colored, um, but I think it's a little bit more complicated because I think colored in some ways is its own identity. Um, whereas first generation mixed race South Africans, you can be identified as colored, but you don't have any colored family. So it's a bit more complicated, mm. but I would certainly, off, I'm, I'm usually identified as colored, you know, by people who just see me. Um, it's complicated too. Like I can say, but at the same time, I have certain proximities to whiteness that you know don't make my experience the same as someone who is purely identified as as a black south african mm -hmm. so but at the same time uh there are also various forms of oppression um into which you know i i am experienced 
but it's quite funny because I've just had a son. Um, <laughs> my my wife is also um, someone who identifies as coloured. She's, I suppose, Cape Malay. Um, but my son looks so white. And I'm like, I actually realise, like, you kind of forget living in South Africa because if you're not white, you're not white. I was like, where did all this white DNA come from? Like, they're like blue eyes and like the hair is light. And I'm like, this son is not getting the land. Like, you will not get the land. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's, it's very interesting. Yeah, mm. because it's like fire box. You know, it's mm. like a claim about Mundo Mnyama. We talked to us when both of us were doing Mundo Mnyama. But anyways, we'll get there. No, yeah. look, I've always felt felt claimed and I've always identified as black um, in a political sense. But I also realized that sometimes claiming those things like doesn't isn't productive because at the same time there are forms of um you know uh, privilege that i get from my complexion or mm -hmm. from being able to speak in a way that sounds white or from just understanding whiteness because my mom is white so i also am, am mindful that you can't just claim and pretend like uh, everything is the same when in actual fact sometimes you get benefits undue benefits that you know that aren't the same yeah um, we'll, we'll have some time to ventilate that. Yeah, for sure. Um, can we talk entity a little bit more? Mm. You and AK. Yeah, how did we go into race? We were an entity. It was... Uh, because I'm <laughs> excited. I'm talking to you. Like, sometimes you're, as, you're only as good as your dance partner. So some this of these true. interviews that we have, it's like, I'm limited because the person I'm mm. speaking to, I can't even mm. segue into interesting places. Yeah, yeah. You know, we'll come back to race. Don't worry about it. No, for sure. Um, it's, it's so interesting being interviewed. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And you're an so interviewer as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, AKA, of course, is a clear success from that rap group. Mm. Um, it becomes who he becomes. And I think he's an iconic figure in South African hip hop. Sure. Um, I think that South African hip hop vastly transforms in terms of it attracting sponsors and money as a result of him and mm. Casper and the conflict. But before that, mm. it, there's him in entity. What mm -hmm. happens? Who forms entity? Why uh, a bunch of school kids in high school deciding wow. uh, they're they, yeah. they, they, they going to form a hip-hop No, group? let's go into the archives. Let's mm -hmm. go into the archive of, of South African hip-hop. Um, entity was originally um, a group of six people. And it wasn't just a rap recording group at the beginning it was dance so like we were popping and locking yeah. and, uh, and uh, crumping <laughs> crumping was even later like this is pre-crumping yeah um and beatboxing so we would um during break or after school we'd go to this bench at our school and there were the people who were the best beatboxers the people who were the best rappers and that's how it started so we used to create entire songs with just like beatboxing and rapping now over time people started dropping out of the group so think about it and i i kind of identify with this now they're black parents who have sent their kids to saint john's right one of the premium schools in the country and they're like you went there to rap <laughs> you are leaving this group yeah. like we did not send you to the schools you know to become a rapper so from six it went to four um from four it went to three and then the three of us who were the, the, the three people who were like finally in the group were the ones who were most committed to really making sure this group like eventually happened. Even though the fourth person, Books, literally had to drop out because his parents were like, we are not supporting this. He ended up becoming a brilliant producer and producing Bumper and, and all of this. A lot of AKA oh, stuff. Bumper, oh, pro kid. Yeah, yeah, he oh, produced Bamba, he produced a lot of Kuli Chana. Oh. He produced a lot of AKA, <gasps> early AKA, yeah. Wow. yeah. So, so he's also someone who's done great things from that group of friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the three of us really tried to become recording artists. And we, the group entity then recorded a demo album. The first time any of us was ever in a studio, um, we recorded two songs. And from that, we then got signed to a label and actually recorded an album but so, who sees that and hears it like like it was it's, it's a grind for other kids i mean even nati we had a similar yeah. high school like yeah. even myself yeah, similar sure. high school crew whatever but it's like yeah. you knew what there's no way you're gonna make it like because you don't yeah, have it's yeah. in cape town there's no industry no no who's like, listening to you guys yeah and and i'm quite 
I'm quite disappointed by the way AKA talks about this because he's very dismissive of that early period in his career. And he's like, oh, we were rapping about cars, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and then the real stuff started. Yeah. No, no, I was there. I know how it started. Mm. And it was really hard work. Like we were at school. We were also trying to do well at school. And we were trying to produce an album in 2004. Mm. Like, I just... I just don't even know, like we, we recorded demos. We learned how to produce music ourselves at the age of 13 and 14. Wow. We learned how to rap. And then we actually got signed. Like we had to shop this demo around. We were performing at different places. And mm. we had this performance in Orange Farm at an event for Love Life, um, <laughs> an NGO at the time that was really big. Was that going to Love Life, my daughter? Is that going? About the island, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so Love Life had this thing. We came together. My brother was working for Love Life at the time. He was like, can you guys come and perform? Mm. Um, and our, our party trick was always beatboxing. No matter what happened, when, when a crowd was around and someone started beatboxing, everyone would just go crazy. And so like we're in Orange Farm, there are like 300, 400 people there. And we start beatboxing mm. and rapping over the beatboxing. The crowd goes wild. And someone at that thing is part of a record company. And he's like, here's my card. We might want to sign you. And that's how we got signed. Yeah. That performance at, at Orange Farm. And those were songs from the demo? Those were, yeah, songs from the demo. We also had like freestyle raps that we sure. would do. We had a whole performance routine. There was dancing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's that's how it started. We then gave our demo to this company. Uh, the company was actually run by someone called Sipo Zamini, mm. who is now, I think, the head of Universal. He listened to it and he was like, um, there's something here, but you have to pay to record your album. We'll release and distribute, but we're not going to cover the recording costs. It sounds dodgy. And then uh, our parents... Um, came in and helped us pay to record the album. Do you remember the sum? Um, I do remember the sum, but it shall remain unnamed. It was a lot of money for the time. Uh, yeah. and, uh, that sounds dodgy. And then <laughs> what, what is the give? Because yeah. Master P does a give and take uh, where mm. he maintains his independence and he gets a mm. distribution deal, which is 80-20 to his favor. Yeah. But he will carry the cost. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, and that's how he becomes a multi-millionaire in hip-hop in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's always a give and take. So, Guni... What's the catch? Like, are they going to give you half of your I rights? Honestly, I honestly can't even remember the terms of the deal. Yeah. Um, but it was very, I think it, yeah, it was ultimately, in hindsight, very one-sided. Like, we ultimately covered the recording risk and then, like... But still, they're going to derive the benefit They derive quite a income. lot of benefit from... Yeah. Um, listen, the, the lessons of the music industry, you always have to learn the hard way, mm. right? Um, but we were just so excited. We honestly, we were just so excited not even that we were releasing something, that we were in a studio. Um, and it's funny, I, like I always remember uh, Kiernan's excitement. I haven't spoken to him since like 2009, um, but I'll never forget his re uh, excitement the first time he was in a recording studio. And like, um, there was this one day, um, this is like the earliest part of, of his career. Um, we were learning how to produce music and on Fruity Loops, and we were like four. Oh, yeah. yeah, we were like fourteen. We were at my house. Um, we used to live a, a street away from each other, so we lived quite close. And we were at my house, and we learned how to export from the computer to a CD. <laughs> so we exported this beat that we were making together to a CD, and we put it in the CD player, and we pressed play, and the music started to play. Yeah. And we were jumping around the room. We were like, we we did it. We made music. Like we were, we were producers. Like just the idea. Of, of producing music and putting it in a CD player and pressing and it actually playing back to yeah. you was like the, the the ultimate joy for us. Um, and so like I, I harbor many of those, you know, memories. Yeah, you guys won a Cora Award as well. I read that news when I was maybe 16 or 15 on Hype Magazine. Mm, we were nominated. We didn't win it. Oh, you didn't win. We were We was robbed. I thought you won because yeah. I was reading on Hype magazine at the time mm. that there was like a group, a South African group entity, yeah. Cora Award. And the only song I knew was uh, Touch and Go. Yeah. There was another one where I think there were cars in the music video. Mm. Uh, there were, it was a cheesy music video. <laughs> it was terrible. By the way, we didn't want to do that music video. Okay. So Touch and Go 
which was the second music video, was one that we took completely into our control. Mm. First gear. Oh, was, yeah, it's first gear. First so, gear. We yeah. were like, we don't want to do this thing of of trying to pretend like like we're flashy and and like the 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 patriarchal woman in the background <laughs> thing like it just and but we really wanted a music video um and the record label was like we want to shoot this song and we want to shoot it in this way did they cover the cost of the video yeah yeah okay at least um uh, and and they had connections with the people who filmed videos and stuff so they got the crew and and all of that um actually no I, now you i think we ended up raising money for the video but <laughs> but, but yeah hey this thing doesn't sound good eh? um but but they coordinated who would film and, and all of that mm. and, and uh putting it on the airwaves and stuff and i remember them even coming with like those those fake chains and eventually we had to say like no like no further you draw um, the line on fake yeah chains. yeah and i would maintain you know people like even first gear, it's not really a song about cars. That's how the well, music. Well, I remember the music video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's actually a deeper metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> I will defend first gear. It's a deeper. <laughs> it's, it's a metaphor. <laughs> it's your baby. Hey, it's a metaphor about how rapping is like driving a car. First gear, feel the acceleration till you hit oh, the yeah. second gear. Oh yeah, I remember. Bass driven when I pop it into third, third gear. gear. Race my lyrics to the finish in the fourth gear, fifth gear. And this here is what you hear with the rumble of exhaust pipes, like the sound of the crowd when we hold mics. See, the car is like a sound of a crowd when we hold mics. That's dope, actually. If you ever wondered what heat felt like, grab your seatbelt and try to hold tight. So what we were really doing in the song is saying the way we rhyme is kind of like the way people race cars. It wasn't like, oh, look, cars are cool. Oh, yeah. But the video turned it into one of those. I mean, we're a bunch of teenagers. We all have a shared experience. Yeah, yeah. You are 1989, I'm 1990. AK is 1990? Yeah, he's, no, he's 88. 88. So we were like in the same age group and all we could see was the visuals from the video. Yeah. I think even Noz Zobabon, I think, was around the period as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That That was was another Cars-related video that I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember writing the lyrics to it. Really? Actually, yeah, one yeah. of the verses is one of the most dopest verses. Just I forgot it, mm. but I, I I wrote it down. With the S, the other double. Oh, yeah, yeah. Always yeah, been yeah, the talk yeah, of the yeah, table, yeah. corner to corner, yeah, color, but something like mm, that. Mm, yeah, mm. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. What's the old Bible? Yeah, yeah. What's the old Bible? Yeah, yeah, that was that was a dope song. But yeah, then if you yeah. see the video, you will think that it's all about Vrapaz. Yeah, exactly. You know, there was exactly. always a message. Um, um, what did you learn from that? I want to move because I know we pressed for time. I want to move from there. What did you learn? From from hip hop, from from working with AKA, from working, what, did you feel at home in in music in the industry? So you know, it's funny because I've never spoken about my relationship with AKA yeah. in public, basically since since then. Um, but before I get there, uh, I learned a lot about life to the extent that that was like one of the first important friend groups that I had. Um, and I am still really good friends with Ntlantla, Greyhound, um, Books. So even though most people know AKA and for good reason, because he's super famous, it's actually fascinating to watch how the different lives that were within those that group have actually moved in different directions. Yeah. Ntlantla ended up studying law. He's created his own company now. Books became a brilliant producer, um, was more in the background, but produced a lot. Um, I went a more academic publishing route. Yeah. AKA obviously did what AKA did. So it's interesting. It's fascinating to look back and see how in our lives, you know, we have friend groups in certain times and then we we go our separate ways. Um, but yeah, I harbor a bit of confusion and um, sadness with the way that fame in some ways changed AKA. Yeah. Um, you know, having been really good friends, like sleeping over at each other's houses and, you know, doing this thing together. Playing PlayStation play, together. Playing PlayStation, me always beating him at PlayStation, <laughs> um, at FIFA. We cannot verify that. At FIFA, <laughs> yeah. Um, and all of us together, like this really tight-knit friend group. And I think fame does something to people, you know. And the more famous he became, the more detached he became from that original group of friends. Mm. Um, and 
I think I've I've gone through different emotions when thinking about that. You know, mm. the first one was resentment, like, oh, so now when you're successful, you 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 totally forget about, you know. Um but I think I'm more sympathetic in some ways now as well, because I think it's really hard to be famous when you're young. Yeah. Um it really plays on your mind and it can destroy you. And we often see the positive side of fame but it's it's a difficult process to try and understand and it, it can really bring the worst out of people um and i guess he must have been going through a lot you know becoming famous at such a young age um, and trying to navigate that but you know um i haven't spoken to him since 2009 you and know? you've you've um, i mean there's a reason why i called you here is because yeah. i look up to people like yourself mm. you know you have a public mm. profile um, you do radio talks and you, you are a person in this country. Uh, you find a space in terms of known personalities in this country. So it's not mm. like, because uh, you see, as I'm meditating on, on what you're saying, yeah. I'm also observing myself that coming from where I come from, mm. uh, Menyanga, a lot of people d don't get to see a guy like myself coming from there and do the things that I do. Mm. So there's a level of insecurity in how I engage with people. Sure. There's a lot of glory hunters that mm. I tend not to respond to. Sure. You know what I'm saying? And I get it. Like people see you from a distance and they're like, oh, he's making money now. Mm. You know, type mm. of thing. And it becomes mm. very difficult to maintain relationships because you second guess the motives of people around yeah. you. Yeah. So I can sympathize with that, even though his is a different stratosphere. Because like I mm. said, him and Casper elevated this game you could argue that some people are arguing oh, it was to the destruction of the south african hip-hop the beef and stuff like that but yeah i saw money coming in at, at a time in the, in the 2010s no there's 11. no doubt about that yeah. like they took it to another level Absolutely. um and and i i'm always i'm always proud funnily enough when i when i see um and i listen to the music you know and i still see those traces of the 14 year old production um so yeah there's no doubt about that they took yeah. it to a new level um but what I, would you say though if you if you were to see him today and you had a thirty minute conversation uh, since you haven't spoken well, look, in a long time? A lot of things have also happened with his life that you know I, I don't even know if that conversation would would be possible anymore. Um, but I'd want to I'd want to know like why 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 did you disconnect? Um, why did you feel like you you had to do this thing alone without? bringing the people um, who you knew at the earlier part when you weren't big with you. Mm. Um, and what was it about that moment where you felt like you had to do this tunnel vision, um, this tunnel vision thing? And it worked. And it worked. Um, and maybe that's why it worked, mm. you know, because um, you also learn like the others of us in the group were interested in many things, you know, and Tlantla studied law yeah. and uh, he was actually the head boy of the school that we were at. Um, you know, I was interested in academics, aka from the moment was like, this is what I'm doing and this is it alone, you know, um, and he always had that that focus on music, whereas we just, we, we didn't want to be celebrities that much, mm -hmm. you know. All right, um, cool. Nice one. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for opening up on that. No, no, for sure. For um, sure. We, I've had a few conversations with people um, up, and race comes up mm. and... Um, I always quote uh, Dr. Francis Chris Wilson uh, and um, her theory. Um, I've listened to her for over 100 hours with different speeches and stuff like that. Um, and she, her thesis, the central point of her thesis is that uh, what emerges from black and white mm. is black. Mm -hmm. And it informs why a system of white supremacy is necessary. Because if white does not um, react to the threat of genetic annihilation. So in a, in a union between black and white, they copulate and the offspring, she says, is black. Mm. Dis despite how they look physically, it's, it's black. Whiteness as we know it, if white people are not responding to it with a system, system of white supremacy, carving out a space within countries where they exclusively live there yeah. to avoid... Um, the copulating of black and white, whiteness as we know it within three generations uh, ceases to exist, is annihilated. As she says, that the system is informed by the need to avoid gen white genetic annihilation. It's something that they, they would have... 
uh, noticed 300, 400 years ago, which every time there's a union between black and white, black emerges. Um, I'm curious sure. because I'm speaking to you now, you are the result of that union. Mm. And we spoke about whether or not you think you, you identify as black. Mm. Some people impose colored on you. Mm. Um, what do you think of that? Do you ever meditate on that? That who are you or what are you in the grand, grand scheme of things? Mm. And maybe just speak into what Dr. Francis Chris Wilson's theory as well. I know I'm doing a bad job of uh, regurgitating her theory, but I, mm. I, I, I'm not misrepresenting her when mm. she says those things. I think in a nutshell, that's what she says. Absolutely. Look, let's let's come to the idea and then I'll talk about my own personal experience. Sure. But in writing the book, The New About Date, um, what I did was I had to go into the thinkers and the philosophers and the architects of About Date and really try and understand what this ideology and this philosophy meant, you know, because we often think we know what it's about, but mm. it's actually a lot more complex than just, oh, there were benches for black people and white people and, and uh, you know, there was a past system. It was a deep philosophical viewpoint. Mm. And what struck me when I was going into these thinkers of, of apartheid was just how much they cared about what you're talking about, about making sure that what they saw as whiteness wasn't contaminated yeah, the purity of by blackness. Yeah. So yeah. in fact, <clears throat> Sorry. of course, there was a great deal of social engineering to make sure that black people were kept geographically distant unless they were needed for their labor. Yeah. But there was a lot of thinking about the colored population and how that population also needed to be controlled and minimized because it was a signal that what happens? There was all this moral panic about what happens if the society actually, you know, destroys whiteness. Mm. So not only in the in the in the US and in Europe, but also in our context, a lot of the infrastructure of apartheid was about making sure that people never mixed across racial boundaries. From my own perspective. Um, it's fascinating because what a lot of people don't know about me, um, ob obviously they know my father, right? I'm surprised mm. you haven't got there yet. You're probably thinking, hmm, how do I work this father nah, thing? And now I, 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 I made a point not to talk. I about appreciate this. that. Um, but look, I know everyone. Because you are who you are. No, sure. But you I also. Have your own I, profile. Yeah, that's true. But I also know everyone thinks it, right? You know, oh, this is Dailing Bofu's son. And therefore. But I was actually raised by a single mother. My mother hmm. right so and i've always had a good relationship with my father it's not like a harbor resentment but my parents were never married and um i never lived with my father i've never lived with him right I've was always, it circumstantial to the apartheid system of, of the time um, or was there a separation between there, them there was a separation so, so their relationship broke up when i was very young okay so i've always been brought up by my mother um my mother and my father are good friends i saw my father regularly but I didn't live with him, right? So I was in an interesting position. That's my headline, actually. I'm sorry to say that. No, please don't make that. The okay. you, just, you just said you're you a person. <laughs> I mean, no, 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 no. Okay. That can't be the headline. You see, that's how... That can't okay, be the let me just speak to the yeah. audience. That's how no. content is created. No, no. audience. I'm no. Gonna, no, no, you're going to create... I'm not like... trying to persuade you <laughs> to, to back down on your point. Yeah, yeah. I am accepting. I'm not going to make it a headline. No, I appreciate I'm telling that. you that that, that was going to be That's what it would have been. Boom. Yeah, yeah. Then you're saying no, then that's it, like... That was going to be my I appreciate headline. That. I was raised by a single mother. Yeah. Season of Wash. That means more clicks. But of course, yeah. as you listen to the interview, I won't bleep out no, the sure. context. Okay. That's that's not a bad headline. I thought you were going to do Dali Mbofu's son says or whatever. No, no, yeah, no, yeah. no. Um, But I will take it. I'll, 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 I'll do something better. Though. No, for sure. But I also do think at this point in my life, it's important to talk about like who I actually am. You sure. know, Because people jump to many conclusions about who I am. Um, so... I've always had a great relationship with my father. He's had a good relationship with my mother, but I've never lived with him, right? So I am mixed race, but I'm being brought up by this white mother. But I also have a black father who I, you know, see often, right? Your mother tongue is English. My mother tongue is English. Like this Oxford thing is not, you know, like people often talk to me about like the words I use and or, or my accent. I'm like, 
that's how I speak. Like that's how I talk at home. Yeah. Like um, it's not, you know, it's not uh, an act. So on the one hand with my own personal identity, I grew up in a single parent house household with a white mother. And she had another son from a, a white father. So I have a white brother. My father had another son from a black woman. So I had a black brother. So I grew up in this house. And in many ways, my upbringing could easily have been the upbringing of a white child, mm. right? Um, linguistically, um, and actually having like yeah, white experience. Yeah. But I'm always reminded and I always know that firstly, there's something different about me to my parents. And there's also something very different about the way the world interacts with me versus the way they interact with my parents. And when I'm out with my dad or, you know, when the three of us come together, which we really did, but let's say we're going out for a meal, it's my birthday or whatever. I'm like, wait, the world interacts with me the way they interact with my dad, but not my mom. What's going on here? You know, so I, Interesting. I had to come to those realizations in many ways myself. To the point where when we get to now, you understand like, OK, now I get to St. John's. Cool. My parents are now doing well for themselves. Yeah. My father's legal practice has picked up. Um, now I'm at a place like St. John's and everyone around me is white. But I want to rebel against that. And hip hop becomes a place where I can go where I feel, OK, this person is speaking to me. I meet Kiernan. I meet Ntlantla. I meet the black students at St. John's and we start we start finding, you know, um, points of affiliation. And I start identifying as black. Um, and I always have identified as black. My black family has always said, you're one of us. When I go, there's no, uh, there's no, di like, there's no difference about it. Like, and I'm part, I'm also Shubi. Welcome. Um, let's say in the Shubi, I'm Shubi. Um, <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. We'll have to see whether there's a real Shubi there, but uh, no, no. <laughs> um, oh, so, then, sorry for the benefit of the audience. Yeah, yeah. Shubi is a subsect of Kosa people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they speak uh, a strange merge of Sutu and Kosa. When it's really spoken, it sounds Kosa, Sutu. It's a merge um, between them. But, anyways, please. Yeah, go. yeah. So I'm just trying to take you, like, I can talk about it intellectually, but I'm trying to take you through my journey of yeah, identification. It's important that you yeah, do. yeah. And so after school, I have to go to the mountain now, right? Now, how weird is, I grew up in a white house with a white mother, but I must now go to the mountain, right? <laughs> it's a foreign language to it's, you. It's Because like, it's a foreign language to us. Mm -hmm, sure. It's a different language to us who exactly. grew up closer. Exactly. And then when you get there, it's like, shit, mm. the new words for this mm, and that. Mm, mm. But for you, it's like, if you your mother tongue is English, right. already you didn't even understand yeah. Kosa, so it's a foreign exactly. language to you. Exactly. Yeah. And so I then went to live as Lalin for a year. Number one, I needed to learn to speak is Kosa. Mm. Um, understand where my family came from and prepare myself for going to the mountain, right? Yeah. So by that time, I'm identifying and I have in many ways embraced and understood the, the part of me that is closer, that is identified as black. But in my university years, when I come out of that and I come back from the mountain and, and, and I can speak as closer to a decent degree, I can understand it, I then start realizing that I also can't just pretend like I am seen as black by everyone. Mm. And, and you go to Cape Town. I go to Cape Town. Unfortunately. Now people think I'm colored. Yeah, obviously. They, you know, they're like, where? Exactly. They think you're colored. Exactly, right. So my, my process of self-identification self has, has always been one of trying to negotiate different phases of my life and understand and un unlock different parts of myself. And the irony is that I understand a very broad sweep of what it feels like to be South African, but I don't have the depth of purely understanding what it's like to be white or purely mm. understanding what it's like to be black. 
Um, so I sometimes have to sacrifice that depth for the breadth. And that's that's how I see my my identity. Mm. Sometimes, look, the, the interesting thing... I'm just messing around right? with you, actually. That's not an important question. No, no, I, I think it is. I think it is. And what what is interesting to me about being identified and identifying, right, is I have never I have never felt a white person say to me, like, come, be part of us. You're one of us, right? <laughs> like, that's... But I've always felt black South Africans saying to me, mm. you're part of us, Right. And that's why I identify with that side of my, you know, that side of myself. But, um, like I said, having this having this child has now messed with my mind because I'm like, wow, there's actually a lot of there's actually a lot of whiteness in me mm-hmm. that I have probably actually denied, um, and it's it's also been central to who I am, and and um, I have to live and and appreciate that. Yeah, it's interesting. It's very interesting that you are what you are, because it, uh, when you when you interact with this for the first time, you just use assumptions and you say mix between black and white is black. Mm. But when you have a lived experience mm. of that, that your experiences are almost exclusively white because you mm. are raised by a white single mother. But mm. I'm claim and I'm literally I'm literally just. Um, indoctrinating you with the idea yeah, sure. when I, ever since I've heard you say I identify yeah. and I'm like ah, um, um, I'm sorry mm. about identifying um, 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 mm. you are a black person I see the complexity mm. in it yeah. Um, yeah. as well did you gravitate more towards white women as you were trying to date around or like was that a random thing for you did you make any choice mentally to say I will then date colored women mm. black women no I, I didn't um, I think partly because I myself come from a mixed race yeah. relationship um and have i've always been able to appreciate the beauty of whiteness and blackness because i feel it's part of me i think part of how we come to find beauty in others is we see things that we remember about you know things that you know remind us about things um you see someone and you you are familiar with a certain aesthetic which you find beautiful. Yeah. Um and that has always been multiracial for me. So um in my in my relationships that they've been diverse diverse. Your wife is, diverse is a Muslim yeah. uh colored woman from yeah. Cape Town, yeah. Cape Malay. And you know, I've been married for ten years now. So I got married at at twenty, you know, twenty three, as I turned twenty three. So um oh, like I, 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 I i'm out of the i've yeah. been out of the relationship game for yeah, a long time yeah, yeah. anyway but before that like in my teens and early 20s it, it was it was never a question of um, racial exclusivity yeah i find um and i need to be very careful about this as i realize that there is power with the voice that comes with the platform as mm. i'm being interviewed i do mm. say from time to time that i find this insufferable I find being a black man in this world insufferable. That is informed by my struggle in Yanga, mm. uh, my escapes with death, my escapes with this. I think I'm very lucky. Like I'm very, mm. very, very lucky to emerge from that. Mm. And I say my central thesis is that I would not sign up to be black in this world the way that it's designed. Yeah. Um, I would rather even not be here. But I, I'm saying, I, 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 I preface it by saying I need to be very careful when I say that because it can mm. be construed differently and we have a responsibility because we have a platform. Um, I find it difficult to be black in this world. Uh, I think it's not designed for me. Um, Mm. I think that it's designed to use my skills as a laborer um, and pay me the bare minimum. And I find that, and I rebel against that. Mm. That's why I don't have a normal job. But then you have to find a way uh, to feed your children. You have to find a way to live within that as well. Have you, are you aware of how difficult it is to be a black person in this world, given your your experiences? You know, in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. And that's why, you know, I I, I try not to claim that um, your experience is the same as mine mm. because there are important differences in our experiences. But what I will say is that my vantage point is a very interesting one because I'm able to see the difference between being black and being white very immediately right it's in my family yeah right 
And so I immediately understand that I know the black people in my family, I know the white people in my family, and I know that there's no difference in talent or creativity or brilliance between them. Yeah. But half of my black family is in poverty, you know, in a rural village in the Eastern Cape, sure. and my white family is not in poverty, right? Um, so I think to some extent, being mixed race has brought home to me and literally home racial inequality, right? Um, I know if I use the surname Walsh that I can get to see a house that's on, on, on show. But if I use the name Bofu, I won't. Um, I'm the same person, but I know those things because I've tested them. Yeah. Um, I know that if I speak to someone over the phone and they hear my voice, they assume I might be white and then they'll invite me to something or I'll need to get some benefit and I'll show up there. And then suddenly I experience their reaction to my blackness. So I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that there is structural racism embedded deeply into the fabric of our society mm. and that it oppresses black people and it privileges white people. Mm. And sometimes, most of the time, I'm on the receiving end of that, but other times I'm on the benefiting end of that. And um, in both cases, when I get undue privilege, and when I'm on the side of oppression, I experience that and realize it's injustice. Mm. I always predict that anyway in the next 10, 20 years, uh, the, the situation is so bad that it would, it would surprise me if there is no civil war-ish type of uh, uprising. Uh, when you take into consideration that 60% uh, of the workers in this country are black and are living are earning less than four thousand, uh, which is less than the minimum wage. And also, uh, when they talk about unemployment statistics, uh, you know who's unemployed. Uh, you know, I I I don't think that there's any motivation for black people in this country to maintain the system as it is. I think that uh, all signs leads to them just destructing the system. Of course, similar to the fears must fall movement, what happens after this destruction? You know, what yeah. is the end result of the destruction? Yeah. Um, and I think perhaps people need to figure that out. I don't think that they will figure it out. What they will, what they will figure out is that they are pissed off and somewhere in the next 10 years, they're going to burn shit down, um, literally. Because I'm not a scholar. I'm not educated to the point where I have to describe it in a, any way different other than to say they're going to burn shit down. Mm. I think that that's going to happen. Um, if you were to look at what happened uh, with... Uh, predominantly what happened in the case at the end last year mm. uh, with the looting. Um, I think that at some point, the country is going to be very difficult to live in for black people because they will have no motivation, no stake in what is happening currently. Mm. Therefore, they're going to rise up. Similar to what happened um, in the Arab Spring, Tunisia, Algeria, Egypt. Um, then you have to then ask the question, with what happens thereafter? Uh, you know, uh, Have you ever had thoughts about... Mm where the current situation is going with South Africans. No electricity, no jobs. Um, you can see that even where I come from in my city in Cape Town, you can see the spatial planning is yeah. done deliberately to say like, if you're one hour, one hour away from the city, you're poor and you're black. Mm. If you're 30 minutes away from the city, you're colored. If you're 10 minutes away from the city, uh, you're white and you're privileged. Mm. You know, even from the planning of the space, uh, the design of the houses, the services that are provided within those places. Mm. You can see which this, it's, there's a situation percolating here. All it needs is for people to not be employed uh, at a rate where they feel like, I, there's nothing for me anymore mm. in this country. Let me burn it down. Look, I'm, I'm deeply worried, as you are. I think we can all feel a sense that the country is slipping away. It's nose diving towards some kind of major crisis mm. and you know that that just gives one sleepless nights i don't want it to descend into violence though either um but it's clear that if we don't do something radical in the true sense of the term if we don't do something radical meaning uproot the inequalities and injustices that are at the heart of our society, then we will be uprooted, whether it's 
this year or in 10 years or in 50 this 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 cannot cannot survive and sustain itself but there are also other interesting things about the structure of our society that mm. in some ways prevent the civil war or, or the violent uprising that many have predicted um and part of it is geographical right is that people have been put so far away from the centers of power and privilege mm. that it's actually hard like to go from Ekukwala to Joburg, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. The you know, so what I fear even more than just a violent uprising or, or um, an unproductive, um, chaotic rebellion is just the status quo getting deeper and deeper. People just going more and more into poverty and not even being able to launch a, a rebellion because... There's not enough food for a rebellion, you know. Yeah, and um, just yeah. just on that point, I'm so sorry. Mm. Um, you can see it when people are protesting mm. that because of the lack of resources, the train system is no longer working mm. and stuff like that. That mm. instead of going and marching to the CBD, what they do is they destroy the traffic lights within their area, exactly, which inconveniences them. Yeah, you know. So you can learn something from that. True. From analyzing True. that, that. If mm. there was some form of a transportation mm. which eases them to go to the CBT and voice their grievances, yeah. they would do that. But there's not even such a system. That's why they burn their own schools, they burn their own mm. clinics. But I do think that with those people, with such a frustration where you burn your own schools and clinics, yeah. it o it's only a matter of time that they will find a different way. And it's, mm. it, it needs an instigator who will say, I will provide resources for this to happen. Mm. And who mm. knows if that's not the ANC when it loses power. Look, that's possible. Um, and I think that would be a, a terrible situation. You know, um, there are people who talk about violence and war as if it is, you know, uh, a necessary evil to get to a better place. Mm. I'm, I'm not one of those. You know, I think that we need to do everything in our power and it's still within our power to peacefully remake the society. And we can do it, you know, quite quickly, I believe. Um, but if we don't, then, you know, and I do think, you know, it's almost become fashionable now for some reason to not talk about race and racism. You know, people say, oh, well, the problem is not, you know, let's just put the best people in the best positions. Mm. And, you know, racism is not the reason why ESCOM is. And that's true. Not everything is racism. And the ANC government itself has made massive uh, mistakes and has betrayed South Africa. Um and we and should not be voted for but that doesn't mean that the structural racism that has always existed went away somewhere mm. and it feels to me like people now want to divert the question about racial justice by saying no but what about the government no no both must be dealt with we must deal with this anc but that doesn't mean that we're going to now accept the racism which has always been part of of the problem and those two problems are our are our problem at the moment it's not one or the other yeah yeah do you do you believe and this of course i always try to give context to it because the iec national election result will tell you that from 67 percent to 65 to yeah. less than 60 yeah. percent now 55 do you believe that there's a genuine strong possibility that we'll see a government of national unity in 2024 I'm worried. Why? I don't think that we who have abandoned the ANC appreciate how much support it still has. And there has been this assumption that, oh, well, they're going to 45 or 40 in the next election. Mm. My worry is they just get 50 or they get 51 or even 49 and they take some small party. Yeah, because at 45, they can always persuade Action SA, who, who last mm. time got 6%, mm. to Tlanganesa with them and get 51. Yeah. Look, I think at 45, we, we, we could then actually have a new government where the ANC is out of power. I do believe that. But 49 or f 50, then we would have a situation where the ANC clings on for another five years yeah and that, that will be insufferable and that that is just 
a prospect that is too terrible to imagine, right? Because what that would say is no matter how much damage you have caused, we are we as a country are saying we reward you with more power. And then what 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 should ANC leaders do? I yeah. mean, we've sent them the message that it's okay to do what you've done, you know. So I'm really worried that we are still not going to get the message that the only language the ANC understands is losing power. There's no other language the party understands. They still think they're doing a good job. I, I'm telling you, when you speak to people behind the scenes, um, you know, a lot of people think I come from the EFF. No, I come from a very ANC family. Uh, my mom was a senior ANC leader. Um, my dad was in the ANC until like last 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 week in historical time, right? So I, I'm actually more connected to the ANC than I am to the EFF. ANC leaders think there's nothing, there's nothing more they could really have done. They they've done the best with what they were given. You know, they have it hasn't, the penny hasn't dropped that they have failed, and the only way it will drop is when we take power out of their hands. Mm. And I'm worried that we're still going to try and give them one more chance in 2024. Yeah, I I tend to want to agree with you on the percentages. I think mm. we can all acknowledge that there's a strong possibility of dipping to less than 50% mm. because, of course, we just watching the sensible chronology of what has happened, yeah. the steady decline uh, after every national election. Um, if last time around was 55%, mm. you can expect that the next time around it could be a 40-something. And I think it's true, actually, that you don't overrate how far they can drop because um, it can't go from 55 to, like, 39 mm. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. you make a conservative estimation that it could be forty seven percent. And yeah. once forty seven percent, you can persuade the UDM mm, will get one percent. Yeah. Persuade, persuade someone else with fifteen yeah. percent. Yeah, and uh, then, yeah, then we're in the same mess, you know. Um, and I, I firmly believe um, we have to remove the ANC from power. So we, we're going to have a choice. Let's say the ANC gets forty five, right? And all the opposition parties combined get fifty five. And then opposition parties will have a choice. Do we keep the ANC in power or do we form an opposition coalition? I firmly believe we need an opposition coalition for no other reason than that we need to send the message that if you, if you mess up, you lose power. The ANC needs to understand that. We as South Africans need to understand that. Maybe five years after that, the ANC will come back. It will reform itself on the side mm. somewhere and... You know, it'll have an interesting new regeneration. But until we send that message, then we will always be in the situation of being at the mercy of the ANC. Yeah. And I'm, I think someone actually has to say, I'm prepared for whatever, whatever uh, drawbacks come with that. You know, we, we might even get, you know, a president we don't like. We might get... You happy with John Sinezen? No, I think that would be silly. It wouldn't I, I be. Think, it's a logical. No, no. It's, it's a logical no. possibility that if he's the leader of the biggest yeah. opposition party yeah. uh, within that uh, coalition, yeah. that he then uh, should be logically expected to be the front runner, unless the party and himself included yeah. makes a sacrifice to say, "Let's elevate someone else," but who is that someone else? That's true, and and I think I think they should. Um, but it who would, is that someone else? Would be unwise. Whereas, four maybe six years ago, we knew that. There was always Musi, there was always, um, uh, who was this other lady, Mazbugo, mm. uh, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. She left uh, yep. to go study elsewhere. We also knew Uti Helen Zilla was one of the leading yeah. voices. Abba Pum Zile Fanta, and Abba Ban Ban. Like mm. we knew Uti, okay, these were the emerging voices yeah. within the yeah. DA. I think the power has now been centralized to say either John Stenhazen or uh, mm. Helen Zilla. Like you don't really oh, identify someone. Okay, else. no, now, okay. Let's vote ANC then. <laughs> no, no. Um, <laughs> no, I agree. I've actually also written about this and even did a video about this that sure. suddenly, if we do vote the ANC out, the logical next person is John Steenhazen, yeah. right? And that's a deeply unappealing prospect. There's no doubt about that. And I wouldn't... So uh, Those parties must come together and find someone more palatable than John Steenhazen. It may, it, it's possible that it could be a sacrifice yeah. um, within that coalition. They take 
a, a leader of the party that has six percent only because yeah, yeah. they the, the DA if they are made to make a sacrifice, mm. they're not going to transfer the sacrifice from Johnston Hazen to yeah. say, okay, how about you, the EFF? Because they're not going to want Julius Malema to be yeah, yeah. Uh, the leader of the True. country. And there are creative things that can be done in this country. You know, like we must try and reimagine more creative solutions. Those parties could come together and say, you know what, actually. Um, we want an independent president who has who enjoys wide support of the country and we'll put them as the president mm -hmm. and will preside over the rest of the cabinet. We understand that none of us enjoys enough support to have a presidential candidate, but we will drive the political agenda. That's an option, you know. But this thing of us always thinking like, oh, well, if it's not the ANC, then there must be some. Mm -hmm. There are creative ways. But I'm prepared to say this. I am prepared to say this. It's too important that we remove the ANC from power. No matter, no matter what, an opposition coalition is going to be preferable because, quite frankly, I would rather have an unpalatable president for five years who can be voted out again than be in stage six for five years. Yeah. I think and a lot of people will agree with now. you. Yeah, that's the choice. And if we have to, if we have to swallow porcupines <laughs> to get to that more important overriding statement, which is that the ANC has had 30 years and has failed, then unfortunately we're going to have to swallow the porcupine. Well, a lot of people won't want to swallow porcupines, but they will <laughs> agree with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Your thesis about the ANC must be removed from power. Yeah. yeah. Um, and those opposition parties must think about this. Right? Yeah, that's, the, that's their challenge. They on must their hands. rise to the political wisdom of realizing, hmm, we may not have a presidential candidate. Who could we convince maybe to stand as president? I'm in my show. You know, um, it's tough. It's tough. We don't have perfect options. Yeah. But the question is that or stage six? You tell me. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. In your engagements with uh, Ukwogo Obramachiri, he mentions, and of course, this is statistically available as well, the ever increasing number of people who uh, turn their backs uh, on the ballot. Like people who don't vote who are eligible. Mm. Uh, the number sits at between five and six million. Mm. It, I think, uh, we can bet on this that it will rise to somewhere between eight and nine million. Mm. Uh, now, how do we convince those people? Because they're not doing any justice to the cause when they turn their backs on the yeah. political process, well, which is available. The electoral process that's available. Let me tell you what I what I would actually love. Sure. N never mind an opposition coalition and whatever, right? I would I would love for there to be a political alternative that we built, so like our generation, mm. and a true alternative, not from a breakaway from any one of these parties, but our generation coming together to say, you know what, actually, it's time that we we took the whole thing um, because this older generation has just lost. And the current political status quo hasn't been able to generate anything exciting. And we actually built a new political alternative from the ground up. And I think it's doable. But the problem with that, right, is you need a billion rand. Yeah, for it. sure. <laughs> so there's a direct correlation between you campaigning yeah. and the amount of money you spend on campaigning exactly. and the percentage you will earn exactly. at the national election. Exactly. Isn't so, that problematic though? It is problematic. And many people um, say to me, why don't you go into politics, right? The reason I don't go into politics is because I don't believe in any of the current... I couldn't live with myself in any of the current parties, mm. right? And I would need to feel at home, politically at home. And I don't feel politically at home in any of the parties. But I'm not going to do a suicide mission where there are no resources and you you know you end up embarrassing yourself so yeah. if i were to ever get into politics best believe that there would be a plan there would be resources and it would be done right because i wouldn't be interested in just doing you know something for five percent it would be how does this entire generation win power in one election you know um so the the thing we would have to do is figure out how are we going to marshal those resources so that we can take down a massive political establishment? And you need a billion. So that's the question. How do you get the billion? And then when you get the billion, you can't get the billion from somewhere 
and someone who's going to tell you what to do mm. once you get power. I mean, Rob right? Hersoff has, uh, I've, been, I've said this to yeah, Penno because yeah. they have a good relationship and I, yeah, yeah, I have yeah. a relationship with Penno mm, mm. and I pressed him on this and I said, if I've never heard a puppet master speak, I believe when I'm listening to Rob Hersoff, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to a puppet master, mm. whatever that means. But I just said that and I, because I had heard him for the first time speaking mm. maybe two months ago and I'm like, oh, oof, yay. Okay, you sound like someone who sends people to do things. Mm. Uh, the brazen nature in which he was speaking. Yeah. Um, and then he's been on that campaign of speaking now. Why do you think I saw talking? that speech as well. Yeah. Um, and a couple of things came to mind. Mm. Firstly, I want to say I think it is brave and important that someone like that is prepared to speak out and actually say that we're in a crisis and the crisis is of the ANC and indeed Cyril Ramaphosa's making. Mm. Part of the problem we've had over the last five years is that everyone who's powerful, everyone who's rich, everyone who's senior, everyone who's a politician, former ANC politicians, all want to keep quiet when we can all see the country is falling apart. Mm. So I appreciate that step, but I, I have huge differences with you know um, his decision to fund institutions like Afri Forum, the Institution of Race Relations, which I believe are regressive institutions that perpetuate forms of racism. So I think it's important that many people in South Africa speak out, but we have to have a, a serious debate about what's going to replace the ANC. Because one thing we don't want to do is replace the ANC, send that important democratic message, but then suddenly we find ourselves in, in a potentially worse position. Um, yeah. So like I was saying, in a perfect world, what I would like to see and what I would even like to, to be a part of if, if, if it was possible is that new thing that really has a fresh new vision for the country led by young people that is funded in a creative way that does not just rely on billionaires telling you what to do because I'm not convinced that billionaires necessarily know what to do i think we can we can make the logical assumption that they want the status quo to be maintained of course they don't I want so. they don't want stage six which affects directly their businesses yeah, yeah, exactly. so if they were to fund whatever new vision there is it mm -hmm. would be for the maintenance of the current status quo yeah which yeah. is 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 not forcing the transferring of economy and land and power yeah. to the poor or yeah. a better distribution of income in yeah, this country. Absolutely. So, so with that being said, uh, when I listen to Rob Hersoff, I'm going to go back to this, that he actually was talking about the way that he was speaking when it was so worrying. Besides the speech that everyone has seen, there was a Zoom interview he was having on another YouTube channel. Okay. And he, he looks like, I mean, don't be surprised to, to get an a DM from him, for example. Okay. It looks like he's been scouting uh, mm. young South Africans who have a, a follow. He spoke about Megji, he spoke about Penwell. Um, I wish I still had that link. I would send it to you. Mm. He spoke about a lot of people. I'm like, hmm, this sounds like a person who's been scouting mm. who are the best black kids who can propel his message forward. Mm. You know, the way he was speaking. That's why I was saying, like, if I've never seen the puppet master speak, I believe today from that moment I've seen you know, would you would would you be happy to be funded by him? You're saying creative ways to be funded, mm. um, and you don't want to be funded by a billionaire. What yeah. if that was what, that was the option on offer? Um, I, I I don't think so. You know, um, I would be happy to have a platform that many people contributed to, but I wouldn't feel comfortable knowing that I was beholden to just one person who also has a political agenda. Um, so I don't think this platform needs to say like, you're not allowed to donate mm. if you're rich, but there needs to be a diversity of donations so that no one person can call the tune and there would need to be political principles in place before, which if you're giving money, you must accept. Like we're serious about redistribution of, of wealth in this country. Mm. We're serious about racial justice. Yes, we want good governance. Yes, we want to fight corruption, but we're not going to do so under the pretext of, you know, scrapping uh, redistributive measures and bringing the black majority out of poverty and, and giving, giving them power. So if you're not on board with that, 
I think it's a, it's a fool's errand to start something because you're going to end up disappointing people. Mm. And yes, you you get a bit of limelight or you get a bit of power, but um, this is something um, my father actually has always taught me. Um, always think about long term and potentially how history will remember what you've done. Um, and that's sometimes why he does things that look crazy in the moment, yeah. you know. <laughs> um, but when you look back further, you know, you start realizing, okay, he's a long-term decision maker. So I think it would be short-termist to to just say, oh yes, someone wants to give me money now. Let me let me do this thing. No, mm. I think we have the creativity and the capacity to figure this thing out. It's just that you know, like life comes in the way and all of that. But ultimately, what our generation should be doing is saying. How many of us are there? Um, what wealth can we put together with all of us? Um, and how do we drive a specific agenda such that we actually take over the country? And not just take over the country, but once we take over the country, we do this, 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 and this mm. for 10, 20 years. Um, and other generations have done it. You know, Other generations have done it. But I'm starting to plant this idea because it might not be me who does it or maybe I'll be a part of it or not, but we need to think that big, you know, um, because no one's going to do it for us. That's for sure. Yeah. What have you learned from your engagements as it relates to this topic that we're on now? You speak a lot to Gogo Obermachik. Mm. Um, and what is taught me from speaking to you is this idea of <laughs> banal options. Zuma is a devil, devil, therefore Ramaphosa is an angel mm. and vice versa. And I, I've come to detest that. I'm like, yo, mm. those two people are those two people. They are neither angels yeah. nor devils. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and, and Ugogo Obramachika speaks more eloquently about that. Uh, he even makes an analogy of uh, angels with hello, with uh, angels with horns and devils with halos. Mm. Uh, Shout out to Ugogo Obramachika. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that man. He's, yeah. he's very, very important. What have yes. you learned from him? Uh, doing content with him, mm. doing interviews. What is he trying to direct us towards? Because I think Naya, we are direct by the ANC, the Nivo, the Lyo, Aio. Forget about it. I think I'm simplifying what it says because he, he speaks no, more true. eloquently, but it says find different alternatives. But what do you think he would say in this moment? What, he, what would he advise us to do? You know, I think what's necessary and what I appreciate about him but what I think is really important and is part of what I'm really interested in as well is we shouldn't assume that we actually know what to do yet, right? Um, I mean, they're easy things. Obviously, you know, roads need to work and we need to get sanitation and electricity and, you know, they're basic things in governance that need to be improved. But uprooting apartheid in justice is 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 not something you can just run into. In fact, you need not only to be wise enough to implement it, you need to be wiser than the apartheid people who put it in place mm. such that it's been there for, for long enough. So what we ultimately need in the country is an alternative vision for South Africa, which does not hold anything as holy so I'm talking about the constitution itself, right? I'm talking about um, law. So when most people talk about what we need to do, it's just what policy should we, should we change, right? Policy change is just the surface, right? Let's look at apartheid, right? They didn't just change policies, right? They didn't say, oh, well, we're going to privatize one thing here. And it started right at the top. There was, there was a vision and a philosophical outlook, that was then converted into a constitutional system, mm. right? From the constitution, they created a set of laws, not one or two, hundreds of different laws that they implemented with speed, right? Then over that, there were policies which reinforced the laws and the constitutional outlook. And then there was a political party which drove all of this, mm. right? So if we're really going to change and move into a new a new uh, country we need a new vision which is constitutional which is legislative which is policy oriented which is economic and which has the political players that are capable of driving it through 
And that's a multi-generational vision. And I don't feel we've actually even created that vision yet, you mm. know, of what needs to be done to, to, because it's actually going to be very difficult. We don't know how deep those apartheid forms of injustice are embedded in our society, mm. you know, and to actually uproot them is going to take massive imagination. So if we can't create it, um, which I would love to be able to do, but you need the resources for that kind of thing, at least we must start talking about it and envisioning it. And that's what Ukogo um, does so well in our conversations. He talks about, well, what would a different society look like? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I enjoy those interviews. Um, and yeah, it's very important. We need to hear yeah. people like that because there's an onslaught from the media. I don't even watch the mm. news. I haven't watched the news in a very long time. Yeah, I haven't sat and watched the news in years, mm. like almost a decade, because mm. there's an, I could see when I was in my early 20s that there's an onslaught, a barrage. Like if you were yeah. coming from a different planet and wanted to figure out what is the problem in South Africa, mm. in the last nine years, you would think that it's Jacob Zuma. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. in the last six months, you would think it's uh, Cyril Maposa. True. Um, you know, there's like uh, an absence of context of why this country is, mm. it looks the way it looks, uh, is the way it is. You had a conversation with uh, former President Jacob Zuma. Mm. Enjoyed that? Uh, what were your anxieties? Uh, it's on 230,000 yeah. uh, views, yeah. you know, um, and it was only 40 minutes or 45 minutes. Mm. And I was like, shit, if I was doing this, I would, I would beg for three hours at least. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. hang out and chop it up with him. How, was, how difficult, even at the level of trying to get that interview? Maybe let's start from yeah, there. Yeah, maybe, maybe he'll come. Um, I... It was, it was really, really tough. One of the hardest things I've done. Mm. Um, what happened, and firstly, let me just echo what you say about the South African media landscape. Sure. Which is part of why I've also tried to, you know, go on YouTube, do something independent. 32,000 subscribers. You've done a great job. Thank you. I appreciate You've that. You've done a great and, job. And likewise. And I was getting so frustrated with being fed this one-sided narrative. Um, I would even go so far as to say that in the Ramaphosa era, this new dawn thing that we were sold actually borders on a disinformation campaign um, and a collaboration between the highest levels of politics and the highest levels of media to feed the nation that there's going to be some big change that never came. And no one's taken accountability for how that narrative was sold to us. And everyone can see that it uh, was based on false pretenses and premises. Mm. Um so I actually interviewed former President Zuma's then lawyer, advocate, Muzi Skakanya. That, 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 that dude yeah. is dope. He really is. <gasps> and um, it was fascinating. <sighs> um, and I spoke to him and after the interview, that interview is also done really well. And he said that was really refreshing. Uh, by attack or all, like every time the they speak in right? media, they get attacked. That's the thing. And... This is also why I like your style of interview because there are many different forms of interview, right? Mm -hmm. You can, and sometimes you need to attack someone, right? Or sometimes you need to press, the issue. press them and press, all of that. Yeah. But we've got enough of that in South Africa. That's how everyone interviews on radio, TV and all of that. There's another kind of interview where you try and get things out of people, make them feel comfortable and actually take a step back and just listen. And you'll be amazed what they say that they would never have said if you said, yeah, but what about this and this and yeah. this and you're evil and you're, yeah, you yeah. did this and you're corrupt and all of that. And that's my style of interviewing. And it, might, it could sound as though you are, agree with, you are agreeing with everyone. And that's Absolutely. a downside to it. That's the Both of us, right? we know that. Because you get attacked. People say, why didn't you go harder? Why didn't you tell them they're evil? Yeah. And over time, people will learn, I believe, that actually no it's wise because firstly you treat your different guests the same. So if, okay, if you attacked some people and not others, then there's a problem. Yeah. But you actually get more often out of people when you just sit back and listen and allow them to say what they want to say. So, so advocates Kakane was like, wow, that was a really interesting interview. Um, and yeah, like I think, Maybe Zuma watched that or, or something, but um, I, I eventually got the chance. Um, what happened? Someone called you or you called someone? Um, 
I'm actually thinking now. I don't know if I want to <laughs> necessarily <laughs> say exactly how I got through. To okay, him. cool. Um, because I haven't asked people's permission to tell. No, it's you all that. good. It's all but good. I I suspect he watched that, and um, eventually, at the state capture commission, I was covering it, um, and then someone told me uh, the interview's on. Sure. So now, firstly, I'm super excited because this is huge for my platform. Yep. You know, right? Yep. You know that fee- I'm trying to build some. I'm trying to That's, build an independent platform. That would be platform. my first million of views yeah. interview. Oh, yeah. If Definitely. I got him, Definitely. that would be my yeah. first million. In, in fact, I'm quite disappointed it's not even a million. I was expecting a million, right? <laughs> so now, the thing is, I think it's about the time frame. Yeah, so yeah, the true. logic of the algorithm, sorry to segue a little mm, bit. Mm, sure. The logic of the algorithm is that um, if you could prove to the YouTube algorithm that your average consumer is... Th- so my average watch time on this platform mm. is around 20 to 30 minutes. Interesting. Um, you see, so that's like a full episode of Generations. Yeah. So yeah. the logic from YouTube is that take people away from Generations. Yeah, sure. What, let them watch YouTube content. Mm. So if that interview was longer, so the average, you can go back to your analytics mm. and check the average watch time of that. Yeah. It will yeah. probably be somewhere around 20 minutes, which is half of the interview, which is mm. great. Yeah. yeah. Um, if it was two hours, it was two, if it was two hours, you would reach an average watch time of an hour, mm. which is literally like you're making people watch a movie. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And therefore YouTube will then spread it to more people because 230 mm. for a 40 minute interview is dope. Like yeah, yeah. it's a serious number. Yeah. I always get worried when I can, when I, I don't exceed an hour's worth of mm. an interview because I know like the average time will be lower like 18 minutes yeah, sure. or 20 minutes but if it's a two hour interview it can get to 30 35 minutes that's mm. like the max mm. Mm. you know on average if it's watched by 200,000 people yeah. it will be like that so if you had reached at least two hours I believe that could have been an, a, a yeah. million because I watched that interview no no exactly um, thanks for the tip sure hashtag SMWX three hour videos coming up <laughs> spread the fire uh, <laughs> so now I'm so I'm excited, sure. right? Because I've got like, and and not only like the platform, but that's one of the few interviews um, that former President Zuma has done. And it's going to be of historical value too. Sure. Because um, he probably won't do many, many more. But then I'm also like, whoa, I have criticized President Zuma like You've written no songs one about else, it. right? Yeah, I... I've written songs, I've You've written book, cha- <laughs> book chapters, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So now I'm like, does he know? That's the undercurrent. That's the undercurrent. Does he know how critical I've been of him before, right? Mm. In my own views. Um, so anyway, uh, we, we filmed at his house in Joburg and I got there. Um, I was eventually told, no, you can come in with my crew. What's the security detail there? Um, it wasn't. It wasn't like elaborate. Okay. Um, I, to be honest, the, the house itself. But you were searched. Um, I don't think I want to. Like, I'm asking as a creator, bro, because it know, could happen these, to me as well. <laughs> like, things, I need to prepare for it. Um, these things are like security, okay. national security things. But like, I, to I, some extent, I, should, I shouldn't expect that I'm just gonna walk in. No, you won't just walk in. Okay. Yeah. Like all presidents have a, a lifetime security and stuff. So mm. there were there were bodyguards there and all of that, and the presidential protection unit. Um, but so I walk up his driveway, come into the hall, and um, he's standing there, and he's got his legal team with him right, for the interview. Hmm. Um, and I said, um, "Baba, it's very nice to meet you." Um, I was trying to think, how do I break the ice? Like, yes, yes. it's very nice to meet you. I wrote a song about you. It's very, <laughs> it's very nice to meet you. I, I've criticized your entire presidency from the beginning. Yeah. Um, but I remembered that I was actually at school with one of his daughters. Yeah. Um, in primary school, so that's that's what I went with. I, I was like, "Baba, it's very nice to meet you." Um, I was actually at school with one of your daughters, and he was like, "You mentioned it by name." Uh, no, I just said one of your <laughs> daughters, and he said, "Yes." She told me. And I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and you often hear stories of like how friendly um, former President Zuma is. I didn't necessarily get that. I don't know if he if he was, but he was he was friendly. That's that's you true too. Keep that in mind. And he wasn't his 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 lawyer at the time yeah. either. So I was very conscious as the interviewer that. This person is probably skeptical of me. They probably know what I've said about them. Yeah. 
and I need to make them feel comfortable before I start the interview proper and, and getting things out of of the president. And so I came in at a very, like trying to make former President Zuma feel comfortable. I come in peace. Exactly, exactly. Now, some people read that as, now you're Jacob Zuma's fan, right? You're, you're That's a, a difficulty yeah. about interviewing I, I, people. It's so difficult. That's a right? difficulty because you're yeah. representing these people yeah. who consume bias Exactly. Uh, biased reporting. Yeah. In them, in their minds, the majority of them, Zuma is the problem. Exactly. You know, exactly. And, and people have never, some people have never forgiven me for doing that interview. Like, sure. I am now an RET plant. <laughs> I'm part of a conspiracy to protect Zuma. <laughs> right? Like, fre- like. I don't care. I mean, I will be respectful. Yeah, yeah. When I speak to that's you, the thing. I will be respectful. That, that's I the thing. Care. And, and, once again, I firmly believe there are different kinds of interviews. Yes. There are interviews where you go in and you try to make the person look the 22 silly. The 22 million flag, for example. Exactly. Like, hey, what the hell is that about? Yeah. 22 million, not in title. Sure. sure. 22 million flag in this country. Absolutely. What kind of flag is that? But like, you know what? Even there, I would like to sit down. I, once he's been interviewed by other people and all of that and mm. say, what was the idea? <laughs> just, just talk us through how it happened, mm. you know? And but, you, but you do know he's going to spread the propaganda. Yeah, he's sure, sure, sure. He's gonna, yeah. But I also believe that the audience is smarter than people give them credit for. Mm. And part of my ethos is, and I think yours too, is I'm not going to treat the audience like they're stupid and they need to be spoon fed. Yeah. If, if Baba says something crazy, like there's no case to, like there's never been any corruption. Do I really need to say, yeah, but there was this, 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 mm. this, and let me bring out this file and yeah. just let people, like we, we're we smart enough to understand, okay, now the minister's talking nonsense. Mm. The interviewer doesn't always have to jump in and say you're talking nonsense. Just, There's also the context of you could always lose them. You it, can it, always it, lose them. They, they, for Tina exactly. and the interviewers, mm. 10 minutes in, if I ask some stupid nonsense, yeah. the rest of the interview exactly. is going to be bad for everyone. Exactly. It, it's a... Plane crash. Like everyone Absolutely. is going to be through Absolutely. a plane crash. Absolutely. You know. But let me tell you a, a story no one knows about the Zuma interview. Um, hence why this interview style is interesting, right? If you were coming at me like, no, why didn't you do this to me? Why didn't you? Why didn't you? Then I would, you know, I wouldn't want to. But let me tell you something, you something that happened, right? The reward of being decent <laughs> as an interviewer. So one of my strategies in that interview was there was a very specific question that I wanted to lead up to, Right. A punchline. And the question I wanted to ask was how did this how did the spy tapes get published? Right? And who gave the spy tapes to be published? Um, now so all of the opening stuff was to get the president to be comfortable enough. It set up a punchline. I to, get it. To say, now, there's this thing about the spy tapes. Mm. And, you know, how did you get them? And all of that. And he started. And he was about to tell me. He was like, ah, I've been waiting for someone to tell me about the spy tapes. You know, because actually, and his lawyers came in. <laughs> and they said, stop the interview. Yeah. We're not going there. And I was like, <sighs> all that, <sighs> all that. Were, and he, he was ready. Like he wanted to spill the, mm. he was like, he wanted to spill the tea. So people don't see that, right? Yeah. And now they see. You're the only person yeah. and myself and other journalists yeah. who know that it's a build up to that point. Absolutely. Right. Everything, the decency, the politeness is a, yeah. de- is a build up to the headline question. Exactly. Right? Just, you're setting up the punchline. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to. So. Now people watch that interview and they think, oh, but now it's just, they don't know the parts that got cut. They don't know the parts that where the legal team said, actually, we can't go there and and all of that. So there's also a lot that people don't understand about the art of interviewing, the strategy of speaking to people and the flack you get just because you spoke to someone. And as I say, there are people who've never forgiven me just because I invited former president onto my channel and didn't grill him. Mm. Yeah, but I mean, I can understand the audience because they're not the creators. I can understand them to an extent, but what they need to understand is that I don't invite people into my house. This is my house, literally, sure. to offend them. Yeah. 
yeah. um, at the same time. So when I spoke to Carl Niehaus, mm. um, and of course, Carl Niehaus loves uh, Jacob Zuma, mm. right? What I was trying to do there is not offend this person, humanize him as much as possible, yeah. because yeah. I'm sure there's been contributing uh, positive contributions that he's made in this country. We'll talk about that. But then when he says things about President Jacob Zuma that I see are openings, I'm like, mm. it's not like you didn't know, mm. uh, mm. that the time you, you, you co-opted him into your ticket in 2012 as yeah. deputy president, yeah. it's not like you didn't know who he was and what he was. Mm. If he's that... If he's the devil in your eyes, mm. for example, the question comes from that. Yeah. If he's the devil in your eyes, it's not like you didn't know that. Yeah. And then he goes into this thing of, yes. And mm. that's why I was devastated. I told Baba it's the biggest mistake. Mm. And then it gives you the context to go to, because when I was working with him during the contestant negotiations, yeah. he was driving a normal car. Within a few weeks, he was driving a Porsche car. Mm. And we, were, we had questions about the character of the man. And so yeah. that could be propaganda or it could be true, you know, but mm. you don't get that if you're combative. If, if you're combative, you're not going to get that information. Yeah. You know, you're not going to get an in on the conversations behind the scenes. Absolutely. Yeah. And look, again, I'm not saying no one should do that, right? Like there are brilliant journalists who are really good at the combative interview. In yeah. five, ten minutes, they can get things out. And that's cool. That's not the only way. That's not the only form of interview that's mm. useful. And, you know, I think the new generation of media that's happening on the independent space actually treats the viewer as smarter than the ma uh, mainstream media treats them and gives them a different perspective to understand the other kind of interviews. Sure. Yeah. You were on main mainstream media leading up to the elections, yeah. 702. Uh, what was the nature of the deal, if you want to talk about that? Like, did they give you that uh, to, say, interview people? Because I, I, mm. I saw you, some of your interviews. I would watch them on your channel. Mm. Uh, I like the fact that actually you took them they would play live on, on radio at the yeah. time which i was not listening to yeah and but i would catch them when you upload them on your platform as mm. well what was the nature of your relationship did they have to buy or pay you for mm. your time what was that what, yeah. what was that kind of a yeah they did so i was actually only on for a month sure. um and i but stood, they were so impactful yeah the, the guests I'll, that you were speaking to yeah i hope i really hope so um and I was standing in for Eusebius Makasa. Oh, yes, I remember now. Who had the show at the time. Yes. And shout out to Eusebius. Because, Between 9 and 12, no? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he would always, um, you know, when, when he was going away, he'd say, look, I've got the platform. I think your voice is an interesting and important one. Why don't you take over the show? Sure. Um, or oh, is that decent of a, of a bloke? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because these people um, are so insecure. People from mainstream media, I, I worked with them. Yeah. That's why I started my own things. Like, yeah. they're so insecure that if you stand in for them, they will never call yeah. you if you do a great job. No, that's so true. And and the funny thing is Eusebius is, is one of the brilliant people at the hard-hitting interview. Right? Sure. The, yes, yes, yes. And people then often that's think... That's his style. That's his interview style. Yeah. And people often think that's who he is as a person. But... That's just the style of interview he's good at. He, like he, he's the most outgoing, interesting, sensitive person who just knows how to interview people like that really well. You know, so I guess it's part of this theme that we've been talking about mm -hmm. about fame and who people are versus who people think they are. Um, so you did so. That so I stood for in for a month, and effectively, they I, I went and I said because I'd stood in for t uh, a two week slot before. I said this is how much I'm going to charge, and. I want to be able to select my own guests, produce the show myself. And, uh, and they allowed you that? And they allowed me to do Fantastic. it. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. So I, I chose the guests along with the producer and it was it was my show. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've told a television channel that I'm going to work in your own terms. Yeah. If and you're not going to allow me to do what I... Because I don't want to... I don't have to work. I, I agree. If you're not you. going to allow me to do... Like, you can listen in and feel and, and pick up whether or not it's quality. Mm. I will give you the right to fire me mm. and I we will not even have a fight. Yeah. You are saying it's not good enough. Uh, we gave you your only way uh, to do it your way. Sure. Uh, it's not good enough. We are taking you off within a week, within two weeks, whatever it yeah. is. Yeah. But I am not, not going to read your own questions mm. and interview in your own style as well. Mm. Do you think you have a future in mainstream media versus what you are doing on um, have you thought about that, that that you would like to be a radio jog mm. uh, what would you like to be and where where do you think you fit in because you're already on 32,000 subscribers yeah. now yeah. so that could be potentially 100,000 subscribers in the next 24 months mm. you know it can mm. be big so where have you thought about where you're going next you know I like the independence of being able to have my own platform yeah but I also appreciate that there are bigger media entities that can partner and the question is what are the terms of those partnerships so right now I'm in a partnership with the Mail and Guardian Oh yeah, I've seen yeah. that. Yeah. So so I write for them once a month. I produce 
a video and then an interview based on what I wrote. And that's interesting because I get to do what I, no one tells me what to say, mm. but I then also have the audience of the Mail and Guardian. Is it the value exchange or there's also compensation within this? There's, the there's compensation as okay, well nice within one. that. Nice um, one. So the way that you, you in, in this is a teaching moment, obviously. Yeah, I sure. always use this as well for the audience yeah, to yeah. ask a lot about that. The way that you would do that would be that they would have approached you and you would know your figure uh, within those negotiations yeah. and you use an agent for that? I had the negotiations myself. Sure. I spoke with the Mail and Guardian and that side and it just started off as saying, look, wouldn't this be interesting? Like there's this interesting independent, more youthful platform. The Mail and Guardian is like a well-known, established, serious newspaper. What happens when we put those two things together? Mm. And then it was just a question of how do we preserve what I'm doing so that it doesn't feel like now you've changed your tone or you're interviewing different people. And what do I feel is the value that I bring so that it makes my channel sustainable. Mm. And it's really wonderful because for the first time, my channel is sustainable. So I'm not just doing it out of you your know, own pocket. Out of my own it's pocket. It's very expensive to run a YouTube channel. It's tough. You Particularly know? if yeah. you want to be professional. And you know, it's, uh, it's difficult to, to put yourself out there week in, week out, you know, and have people have an opinion on your opinion and, yeah, why did you do this episode, not that episode, etc. So it's also emotionally taxing, you know. Um, but I do foresee, whether it's my platform, yours, many of the other platforms that are building now, this is where the heart of talking about South Africa yeah. is. Like TV just sounds so scripted. Radio is just, they're more adverts than talking, you know. Yeah, it, and, like what you said about um, John C. Hazen, mm. uh, I had already asked that from Andle Montana. Yeah. Uh, because we were preempting 2014, yeah. 2024, naturally. And I say, if this is the greatest opposition party percentage, mm. their leader is this. Mm. And then the angle from that, because I'm a journalist, I need yeah, sure. angles. Sure. Will South Africa have a white president in mm. 2024? Mm. That's my headline on that episode, right? And then I don't know which came first, but now you wrote about that. Mm. Just on the point, Guti, how influential we are. Yeah. And then on Meg G, Johnston Hazen eventually goes there. Yeah. And literally, that's the question in South Africa now. Guti, will we have a white president? Yeah. Yeah. And this is the influence of the space, you know. On that as well, if we if in the sad event that we do have a white man president so soon after 1994, that will be an indictment on the ANC. And I think that's how we should look at it, that the failure was so grave that the worst possible outcome became preferable to continuing with the status quo. That's a very good point. Um, can we wrap up very quickly in the next five, 10 minutes um, and talk about fatherhood? Um, mm. How is it impacting you? Mm. Um, and maybe mix it up with uh, the transition from were you ever a Christian at some point mm. and now you're a Muslim mm. type of thing. What, how is your family, fatherhood, and even religion impacting you, your wife as yeah. well? How is that? So I, um, as you, we've already spoken about, come from a really diverse family, not just racially, but also from a religious perspective. So I was raised Christian, Catholic. Um, my mom was Christian. My father's also Christian. But there's also a strand of Islam in my family. So I have lots of cousins. I have some cousins who've lived in the Middle East. Um, my older brother is Muslim. So I've had this religious diversity in my family um, for a long time. So I grew up always having a faith, but not necessarily believing that that faith was the only right route to divine you know, knowledge and understanding. Mm. That religions are often roots to a transcendent perspective. There are many roots to the same summit, is what I believe. Mm. Um, and I met my wife at UCT. She was a Muslim woman and fell in love with her. Um, but also she made it clear, like, if we're going to get married, then I would need you to be Muslim. So that's kind of... Well, how option i was thinking about this question yeah last night that was there no option that in case any south african finds themselves in yeah. that dynamic yeah is there no option to opt out of that no without no. being like still and still be married yeah i think there are many options and you know it's just about the specific relationship and what makes that relationship work so it, I'm, I'm, what i'm where i'm trying to get at is that 
there could have been a situation where you're still married, but you're not Muslim. There may well have been, or there, there may have been a situation where I decided not to become Muslim and, you know, she decided, well, then maybe marriage mm. isn't the best thing, you know. Oh, yeah, I was because I was about yeah. to ask, would it be a deal breaker from a Muslim man or woman uh, yeah. to be, according to, if they're following uh, Islam yeah. to its full extent, that you can't marry outside Islam? Yeah, th- look... There are many ways of looking at it, and there are more strict and more wide interpretations just with every every religion and okay. every but in this particular circumstance, that's what she communicated to me right um it's actually actually no let me not tell that story but, <laughs> <laughs> um, i was I was just telling her I was in love with her, and then she was like, "Okay, but then we need to get married and I was like, "Whoa, whoa." <laughs> I wasn't talking about marriage. In like, the first, like, yeah, the first few conversations. First few minutes, I was like, okay, wow, I, yeah, got, yeah. I, I got more than I bargained for. And she was like, yeah. look, if you feel this way, this is, this, this is the scenario, right? Yeah. So that's what triggered my starting to read about Islam because I didn't know much about it before. I knew I had Muslim family. Um, but I read the Quran, I read the Hadith, which is like the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, um, peace be upon him, that go along with it. And ultimately realized that there are deep similarities between you know all these ethical and religious systems and that um a lot of what i was reading resonated with me um i spoke to my older brother i spoke to my cousins you know and i ultimately believed that i could be a comfortable muslim and your father uh, didn't come back and say no not at all what he, you know about Islam, so. <laughs> <laughs> not at all not at all in fact like he was so supportive and he always had oh yeah because i mean he 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 had a child with a yeah exactly yeah yeah, his outlook in the world is is, is not gonna be conservative exactly and 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 that's just who he is like he's representing zuma even though he criticized him right (laughs) like he he just he doesn't take things personally and and all of that so he was very supportive and loving and it was ultimately a decision i came to with my own study and thought Mm, let's talk about the child and Um, how are you navigating that? It's your first child, five months first old. First child. So we were married for 10 years. Sumeya is my partner's sure. name. Um, we've been married for 10, years. Is she an academic years. as well? She's doing her PhD at the moment at oh. WITS. She also she works at the Nelson Mandela Foundation. A, a brilliant person in her own right, sure. intellectually, politically. Um, it's It's weird, you know, fatherhood. You always hear the story about how fatherhood changes you. And you think like, no, it can't really be like that. But the instant you see that new person, your life will never be the same. And it's really funny because when you see your first child for the first time, you not only learn something about them, but you learn something about yourself, you know, because you're like, wow, I didn't know that I had an essence that I can pass on to another person, Mm. you know, and you see yourself reflected back at you. And so you learn about who you are when this new person comes into the world. Um, And I've always been very clear that I want to be an active father. I want to be there, not just be there, but I'm going to change nappies. I'm going to be up at night when I need to be up. Um, I'm going to give my all, you Mm. know. So that's why I have to leave this interview after this because I have to go back to oh, yeah, you told me that, to yeah. to, uh, to my son. Every morning I spend two hours with him, non-negotiable, like just giving him time and attention. Um, and ultimately, I want I want him to feel like he has you know a, a present, loving father. Um, Your son is a closer yeah. person. Hey man, you know we and we always <laughs> and say this about like... ourselves. Like number one, when you say you're a closer man, then you must be you must be uh, having multiple affairs, and you, and you must be a, a distant father, right? No. But uh, I'm I'm breaking this I'm breaking the stereotype. I'm breaking the stereotype. I told my daughter is ten. I tell her you're a closer woman. That's how the world will see. <laughs> yeah. Like you inculcate yeah. that, but of course with you it's slightly more complex. You no, have for sure, to for sure. have the explanation, but why do I look oh, white if I'm... We're going to go down another rabbit hole, but I'm even sure. like even that idea of like how your identity gets imposed on you as a closer man. Mm. Like, where did that come from? And, and, and why do we believe these things about ourselves that, that we, we can't break out of? Um, of a serial cheaters as closer man. You know, like, okay. You speak em- for Empirically, yourself. that may be true, but that yeah. doesn't mean that just because you're closer <laughs> now you're... Um, and I'm I'm very keen to like break 
a cycle of um, stereotypes about what it means to be a man in South Africa. Mm. Um, and part of that is being a present, loving father to your children and, um, yeah, and and also being someone who can be relied on and, and, and faithful to the commitment you set, if that's what you want. I'm not saying that monogamy is like the only way of doing things, but if that's what you want, you can do it. It's not like it's impossible. Uh, Chukanya Wasta, what you love is cursed by monogamy. Look, that may be true, and I don't necessarily think it's the only route to intimacy. Well, I'm not trying to discuss, I'm just messing around. Ah, we, we, we're you done. see now, you see now. <laughs> the other can can I go back to my son now? Oh yeah, yeah, you can talk about him, sorry. <laughs> no, like literally. Oh, you're literally leaving, <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, I'm done. Um, I've got nappies to change, man. I can't yeah, say a couple right. of things in class. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, mm. uh, I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I was about to start uh, speaking his daughter. But no, I can't do that shit. No, no. I won't um, be there when you are being attacked. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um the Zazise. Uh the in drive value and the suga kukwala. Ika alam li se konwe li pagatikwe pedi ne konwe. Nkosi uh mlegaz gakulu mkun zi sapa and the temple bas is our pindas tet. Funeguze kwi SMWX uh kule nyagezayo. Okay. See, yes, it's a I know my guys, my guys. We 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 coming through. Check, uh, keep an eye on our conversation with um who sees where. Mm. Yeah, we'll be on the season of Walsh. Uh, I'm sure thirty thousand of you and more will watch that. Um, we'll be there talk politics and we'll do an amateur analysis of politics. I'm gonna get you to rap on my show. I'm going to freestyle. <laughs> I'm going to freestyle. Thank you very much, bro. I really Thanks, appreciate this. I appreciate the invitation. Yeah, I was Thanks. nervous about this because um, you don't know how yeah, things could go. No, that's, that's true. It was great. Thank you for the great interview. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for watching us. Boom. Boom.